So, you know, I, I, I've been covering this topic for, gosh, I think about three years now, and you have a lot of different cases. In South America, for example, right now, one of the main situations you see is fathers bringing, trying to, they'll, they're actually traveling with their little boys, trying to get them away from uh, a lot of the opportunities and crime that are awaiting these children right now. So it's, you see a big pattern of a lot of dads trying to get their uh, little boys out there and start somewhere new here in the United States. You have a lot of uh, Chinese citizens who are trying to escape the wrath of the Chinese Communist Party right now. You have uh, probably another, uh, you know, you have an example of like the mother and daughter from Guatemala we met yesterday who are trying to uh, come to America and meet up with uh, the rest of their families that are here. There's, there's a lot of situations, mainly it's people trying to start over. They see an opportunity. Uh, to come into the country right now. Rumors that circulate around social media and the cartel community is that it's now is an easier time than ever to come into the United States. Now, according to immigration authorities in Panama, Chinese people, surprisingly, were the fourth highest nationality to other after Venezuelans, Ecuadorians, Haitians, uh, to cross the Durian Gap to come to the southern border. Um, in the first nine months of the year. Now, uh, does this reflect what you saw at the border? Yeah, so I would say uh, with the encampment I saw yesterday near the Hakala Gap, uh, I would say probably shortly over a third would uh, be members of the Far East Asian community. <laughs> um, so as far as Chinese nationals crossing over, now I've personally seen them uh, at the Yuma Gap, which is actually from the uh, Kuma Gap, maybe about an hour and a half drive east of that location, where you have another part of the border wall that actually intercepts with uh, Indian reservation land, and it creates, it, it just creates a gap right there, so people can just uh, uh, walk through the gap. Now, the interesting thing about that particular area of the Gap Jack is that when you cross over to the Mexican side of the fence, you actually see a lot of documentation. Now, this is documentation ranging from airplane tickets from the nation of Turkey to Mexico to actual identification paperwork and torn up passports. So what a lot of people are doing is that they're actually tossing their information in Mexico when they cross over into the United States, they start over again. They can start over again with a new name if... Um, now, some of these folks are fleeing war-torn countries right now, just situations that are absolutely chaotic. Now, for these particular folks, uh, they it, it's the same kind of thing. Some of them are getting rid of their identification for safety reasons. Uh, but th this is just an interesting pattern we can actually notice at the border when you cross over. You even see foreign currencies from all over South America and the Middle East. People kind of just tossing away their their former life to start a new life here in america um and that's and i i'm guessing that's also a pattern that's happening at other uh open border crossings as well well john are there is there anything else here you'd like to add yes yeah, so we're going to be continuing to report this story for the epoch times and you know uh, long term wise it's, this is actually uh, this actually is starting to cause effects in other areas as far as hospitals, as far as uh, shelters being uh, overflowing right now. We're experiencing a lot of those issues here in California right now, and we have sources on every, on every political spectrum actually sharing this with us right now. So we're going to make sure to keep you guys posted on that in the episodes ahead. Well, John, thank you so much for your time here, and uh, certainly you'll keep us updated. Appreciate it. Absolutely economic issues and immigration. And in some cases, the two topics seemingly go together. The U.S. is planning to give money to the Inter-American Development Bank. The bank then uses the money for a financing platform that will serve middle and high income countries in Latin America. The hope is to expand economic opportunities in the region so immigrants do not head to the U.S. Now, the country is the world is already laughing at us. But we're dividing ourselves with them. While the nation is focused on internal battles, a greater threat looms in the horizon. The Chinese Communist Party. 
放响这样干，必将头破血流。They're systematically infiltrating our government. They're stealing our technology. They're attacking our freedoms. The FBI is opening a new China-related counterintelligence case about every 10 hours. The Chinese are preparing for war. We Americans are very good at being oblivious as to what our enemies are saying. And we did not pay attention to Osama bin Laden until one day he killed 2,977 Americans. This is not just a battle of ideologies or just about pursuit of dominance. This is a war that will alter the course of our lives. And if we lose, it will condemn our children and future generations to a world of unimaginable horrors. This is why my show in the Epoch Times is so critical. We're not afraid to take on the Chinese regime head on. And he said, they told me that they, if I keep talking to you, they're going to hire a hitman to chop off one of my hands. We're not afraid to call out the CCP for their atrocities. We're completely independent. Our only interest is in traditional journalism and reporting truthfully. Bizarre news today. The Chinese Communist Party is opening up police stations, departments, and uh, working as overseas bureaus all around the world, including right here in New York. You heard that right. It's time to replace the Chinese regime's propaganda with truth. Get back to the basics. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All you have to do is subscribe to Epoch TV. You get so AI to gauge the um, the person's interest in videos, understand their perceptions or behavior patterns, and then serves them up content that content that will uh, appeal to them. And some of that content, obviously, today is full of propaganda in support of Hamas, unfortunately. And I think you know when you look into the fact that this company is controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. And given the fact that you see uh, Xi Jinping um, meeting with the Iranians, uh, meeting with uh, the member of the Palestinians that are you know, causing a lot of these problems, you really understand where the Chinese um, allegiance lies, and that is to Iran, and that's to its proxies, one of which is Hamas. To your point, Chairman of the House Select Committee on the CCP, Mike Gallagher, came out with a piece calling TikTok the digital fentanyl of our time. Now, this week, the Biden administration signed a new executive order on AI. Meanwhile, China is actually calling for the world to cooperate and share this technology. Well, how do you read that message given China's history with IT theft? Well, the fuel of AI is data, and China has... You know, not only all of this data, it has all of our data, and that's what it told President Trump when he went and visited um, during his administration. They said, look, we're going to be the um, lead in AI because we have everyone's data, and you're going to have to get in line. So I think, you know, <laughs> cooperating with China on AI is a bad mistake for the free world. In fact, I think it's actually important for us to lock down our data so not only – can the Chinese not have access to it? Nobody should have access to it. I think it's actually a human right that you have the ability to own and control data that is collected about you and data that is owned by you. So I think that's a challenge, you know, in terms of ideology between China's authoritarian system and our democratic or liberal democratic system. You know, privacy, data sovereignty is a key component of that in a modern digital world. Thursday, the Israeli military released footage of more ground operations in the Gaza Strip. Overnight, IDF troops fought against a large number of terrorists who tried to ambush them. At the end of the battle spanning a few hours, including fighting from the ground with air support from aircraft and missile ships, many terrorists were killed. And Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said the Israel Defense Forces have now moved past Gaza City, the largest city in the Gaza Strip. However, Israeli troops may need to be more careful about where they huddle up. Hamas terrorists released a video showing a drone dropping an explosive on what they claim are Israeli troops in Gaza on Wednesday. The IDF continues to attack through the air as well. On Wednesday, the IDF said they've struck over 11,000 Hamas targets. And recently, the IDF has struck Hamas terrorists in refugee camps for three consecutive days. Twice in Jabalia refugee camp and striking Burage refugee camp on Thursday. 
Secretary of State Antony Blinken is now headed to Israel in an effort to help minimize civilian casualties. As democracies, uh, the United States, Israel, other democracies have a responsibility to do everything possible to protect civilians who may be caught in, in harm's way. And this, again, is a, is, is a crossfire, quite literally, of Hamas is making. This is something that the United States is committed to. I'm not going to get into the, the details here, but it's very much uh, on the agenda. When I see a Palestinian child, a boy, a girl, pulled from the rubble of a collapsed building, that hits me in the gut as much as seeing a child in Israel or anywhere else. Lincoln also said they've been able to get more humanitarian aid into Gaza, about 50 or 60 trucks a day. And humanitarian aid has not been the only thing crossing Gaza's border with Egypt. Also on Thursday, President Biden said this. Yeah. Uh, today, 74 American folks uh, uh, that are U.S. citizens. But this Palestinian American on Thursday said she has not been able to leave Gaza. Um, we finally got the chance to almost leave Gaza. This is my fifth attempt. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Israel is helping to supply food, medicine, and water to Gaza. But as for fuel, he said there's been no decision. Israel says the Hamas terrorist group steals fuel from the Gazan people to support its military operations. Jason Perry, NTD News. More calls for a humanitarian pause in Gaza. The Defense Department echoing the White House. It's all in hopes of getting more stranded foreign nationals out of the region. Here's what General Pat Ryder said earlier today. The DOD on the things that I highlighted at the top, which is uh, deterring a broader conflict, ensuring force protection, and also ensuring that Israel has what it needs to defend itself. During a campaign rally in Minnesota last night, President Biden was interrupted by a heckler calling for a ceasefire. Biden then responded by suggesting a humanitarian pause on Israel's end. The White House has previously warned that a ceasefire in the Gaza Strip would only benefit Hamas. Tonight, House law managed fundraising activities for Adams between 2019 and 2021, raising over $18 million for his 2021 campaign. The New York Times reported that she also raised more than $2.5 million for the mayor's 2025 re-election campaign. Today's raid prompted the mayor to cancel his morning meetings to, quote, deal with the matter. A public corruption unit reportedly questioned Suggs during the raid. The U.S. has a new strategy to prevent people from crossing the southern border illegally. That is, giving money to other countries where immigrants can stay. NTD's Arian Pastar has the details of that plan. Stopping immigrants from coming to the U.S. illegally by giving money to other countries. That is a new plan the U.S. is expected to announce on Friday. President Biden is set to host leaders from Latin America and the Caribbean at the White House on Friday. That's to discuss economic issues and immigration. And in some cases, the two topics seemingly go together. The U.S. is planning to give money to the Inter-American Development Bank. The bank then uses the money. We've been acting upon 100 years of precedent has told us that the president must authorize the National Guard and there must be a request from the local convening authority, the mayor or the governor, before DOD can release the National Guard and deploy them, as we say. And he did that days before January 6th. And now you have this circus in Colorado saying, haha, but President Trump didn't order the National Guard because our founding fathers precluded that order from the commander in chief because they didn't want a president to deploy military personnel uniformly in the United States of America. And a similar case is happening right now in Minnesota, but the justices that are today expressed skepticism about whether state courts should have the power to decide on a national matter like whether President Trump can appear on the ballot. So do you think Congress should by any chance get involved in this case and how likely if not when do you think the Supreme Court will step in? Well, cases have to be appealed up to the Supreme Court, and this one would be a matter of great public importance, so it might receive some expedited attention, but they can't just go down and, and sort of take it. Um, and they, the judge is right in Minnesota to express skepticism. You're talking about the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution. That is federal law. It is not state law, and a state court should not be deciding it. But they're choosing these jurisdictions 
on purpose to continue their lawfare for President Trump. So this case, in my opinion, and every case, will end up in federal court and ultimately the Supreme Court. But the damage will be for the mainstream media and the disinformation campaign to have been published yet again that somehow Donald Trump should be removed from the ballot when it's totally unconstitutional. But they'll leave that part out. And before I let you go here, of course, you mentioned all the media reports going on right now about all the legal troubles that from President Trump is in right now. So do you think it's going to have any impact on the 2024 race, according to what you've seen? I think the, the way that President Trump has handled it has exposed the two-tier system of justice in this country in state and federal court. And people, whether they like or dislike Donald Trump, are seeing the way not just the media, but the courts treat President Trump, his family, associates, myself, and others included, and weaponize justice for a political purpose. If you disagree with President Trump on his comments from January 6th or how he took on the border and uh, cartels and terrorists, then you should adjudicate that position at the polls, as we have always done. But it's hypocritical for Hillary Clinton, um, Speaker Pelosi, and Speaker Hakeem Jeffries all to say previous elections were robbed and stolen, and now say Donald Trump doesn't have that right to say that publicly under the United States Constitution. A lot of great insights, as always. Cash Patel, thanks so much for joining us. Both brothers were questioned extensively about their knowledge of statements of financial condition. The statements include the values of the senior Trump's properties and ultimately determine his net worth. Attorney General Letitia James claims the brothers were aware of and knowingly participated in a long-running scheme to falsely inflate the company's assets and that the fraudulent values were used to land loans and insurance policies on more favorable terms than they were entitled to. Her expert, Michael McCarty, on Wednesday testified that the banks lost $168 million in interest because of the misrepresentations. Oh, and by the way, again, the same supposed victims, because it's a totally victimless thing, are saying, no, we did our own due diligence. We made hundreds of millions of dollars. Judge Arthur Angoran, who was presiding over the trial, stated in a previous order that the banks did make lots of money. But the focus of this trial is on how much more money they could have made if not for the alleged fraud. The judge has already determined that fraud occurred. He now must determine the size of the fine the Trumps are facing. Eric Trump is alleged to have signed several guarantor compliance certificates for his father, and those certificates relied on the financial statements. He testified that he had very little knowledge about those statements. When pressed about a 2013 email with part of a financial statement attached, he conceded he was familiar with them but said he would not have personally worked on them. The senior Trump took to social media defending his sons and blasting the judge. Leave my children alone, Angoran. You are a disgrace to the legal profession, he said. Donald Jr. completed his testimony without any cross-examination from defense attorneys. Eric Trump will be back on the stand Friday. Arlene Richards, NTD News. Minnesota's Supreme Court is hearing arguments to prevent former President Trump from running for president. Prosecutors are invoking the Constitution's Insurrection Clause. This is one of several lawsuits that have been filed around the country to bar Trump from state ballots. Those in favor say the former president's role in the January 6th Capitol breach at the U.S. Capitol disqualifies him. Trump's lawyers argue that the events were a riot, not an insurrection in the constitutional sense. They add that the former president has never been charged with such a crime. There is no more political question in our constitutional order than who should be president. That's the predominant feature of our national political conversation. And the Constitution itself devotes more words and more provisions to how we decide that question than just about any other. It's for that reason that when parties ask the courts to step into that process and to decide who can or can't be president, the courts overwhelmingly say that's not a decision that should be made in the judiciary. That's a decision that should be made elsewhere. Uh, we've had two citations of supplemental authority in this case, just in the last week or so. Those courts actually took different approaches to this political question issue, but they used exactly the same phrase to describe the precedential landscape. Both of those courts said that the weight of authority holds that this is a political question, not justiciable. The Colorado and Minnesota gauge the, um, the person's interest in videos, understand their perceptions or behavior patterns, and then serves them up content, so content that will uh, appeal to them. And some of that content, obviously, today is full of propaganda in support of 
Hamas, unfortunately. And I think, you know, when you look into the fact that this company is controlled by the Chinese Communist Party, and given the fact that you see uh, Xi Jinping um, meeting with the Iranians, uh, meeting with uh, the member of the Palestinians that are you know, causing a lot of these problems, you really understand where the Chinese um, allegiance lies, and that is to Iran, and that's to its proxies, one of which is Hamas. To your point, Chairman of the House Select Committee on the CCP, Mike Gallagher, came out with a piece calling TikTok the digital fentanyl of our time. Now, this week, the Biden administration signed a new executive order on AI. Meanwhile, China is actually calling for the world to cooperate and share this technology. How do you read that message, given China's history with IT theft? Well, the fuel of AI is data, and China has... You know, not only all of its data, it has all of our data. And that's what it told President Trump when he went and visited um, during his administration. And they said, look, we're going to be the um, lead in AI because we have everyone's data and you're going to have to get in line. So I think, you know, <laughs> cooperating with China on AI is a bad mistake for the free world. In fact, I think it's actually important for us to lock down our data so not only – can the Chinese not have access to it? Nobody should have access to it. I think it's actually a human right that you have the ability to own and control data that is collected about you and data that is owned by you. So I think that's a challenge, you know, in terms of ideology between China's authoritarian system and our democratic or liberal democratic system. You know, privacy, data sovereignty is a key component of that in a modern digital world pockets, Hamas's leaders have other sources of wealth. Iran gives them around $100 million annually, which it moves through to Hamas via shell companies. Qatar, since 2014, has been giving hundreds of millions of dollars to Hamas. There's also a Syrian fund where several billion dollars have been embezzled. Hamas has benefited from cryptocurrencies and through charities. Middle East expert Barack Sina says these charities and cryptocurrency funds are constantly being identified and shut down. Hamas then opens new ones elsewhere. Sina says Hamas's leaders use a lot of this money to live luxurious lifestyles in Qatar. Much of the rest of it goes to fighting Israel. A quarter in TV News.